again, welcome to tonight's Local Food College webinar on Food Hubs, Community Connections in Northwest and Central Minnesota. As you can see on the map we have up, we have many well-established and burgeoning food hubs throughout Greater Minnesota. And tonight we're quite fortunate to have three expert food hub presenters sharing their experiences and insights from their work leading food hubs and three of which you can find on the map here. We have Rail River Food Hub from the Bemidji area, Fresh Connect Food Hub from the Fergus Falls area, and Sprout Minnesota Food Hub from the Brainerd area. Our first presenter tonight is Melissa Matson. Melissa is the Manager of Administrative Services at Lake Country Service Cooperative located in Fergus Falls. She oversees a variety of programs that support the organizational health of Lake Country's membership and community. Programs include health and safety, cooperative purchasing, dietitian services, worksite wellness, and the Fresh Nest Food Club. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa and I'll pass you the presenters all and get your slides up here. I got to look back to the. Just that. <laughs> yeah. I have to find you in the alphabetized list. There's a lot of participants tonight. All right, take it away, Melissa. Okay. Thank you, Molly. Um, good evening, everybody. As Molly said, I'm Melissa Matson, and I work at Lakes Country Service Cooperative. And I am part of the team that um, works with Fresh Connect Food Hub, which is a program of Lakes Country Service Cooperative. For those of you who are unfamiliar with service cooperatives, there are nine in the state. Um, we were established by legislation in 1976. We do not receive any state funding unless it's a part of a grant. Um, so we are entrepreneurial organizations and we are considered to be a public nonprofit and we serve schools, cities, counties, government, and nonprofit entities. With our work with the Food Hub in particular, one of our strong partners has been Partnership for Health, which um, comes out of the statewide health improvement program. And Partnership for Health in our area covers Becker, Clay, Ottertail, and Wilkin. <laughs> So we get this question a lot, um, why do you have a food hub at Lakes Country Service Cooperative? And it does fit our mission. Um, we were established to do regional planning and partnerships. And as part of our purchasing program, we have been working with food service directors in our region for over 20 years, mainly with the food bid that they are required to do um, with USDA but we do professional development with them. We work with them with our registered dietitian who is Dana Reese. And we knew for a long time of their desire to incorporate more local foods into their daily operations, but we knew there were barriers to it also. We also have Dana, who, like I said, is our registered dietitian, and she actively works in our region <clears throat> and on the statewide level on local food initiatives. Um, she worked with the local food, uh, the Minnesota Food Charter, a lot of work with Minnesota Farm to School, and a lot of work on our regional level with the Food Systems Initiative. So it was a nice fit for Lakes Country with our extensive experience with our food service directors and Dana's work with Community Foods where she came back to Lakes Country one day and just said, what do you think about starting a food hub? I think it could fill a gap in the region. So um, it started with a challenge, which was how do we get fresh and healthy food choices into our school food programs daily? Schools have been doing um, farm to school for a long time. What we were finding is that it was more of an event. You know, they would buy corn and they would shuck it and it would be on the menu one day, maybe twice out of a year. Um, we wanted to make it more of, of a regular part of their operations. So that's how it started with that challenge. We did receive two Minnesota Department of Agriculture grants. One was to form, um, perform a feasibility study, 
And the second was to purchase equipment to pilot a food hub. So we began our um, planning in January of 2014, so just over a year ago. Part of that planning was to pull together a team in our region that could really help us shape a food hub that would be sustainable. Um, we know we started out with grant dollars, but we know to sustain it, eventually it has to um, live off of its own revenue. So we put together an advisory team that really could help us shape that vision. So um, University of Minnesota Extension was involved, uh, some of our public school districts, we brought in a couple people from economic development. Of course, we wanted the growers to have a say in what this would look like. So those people met with us for this first six months and really helped shape and give us feedback on how this Fresh Connect Food Hub would look. Because as you know, if you've done any looking into food hubs, they all look different. One of the most important things we did was we did survey our potential customers. And we asked them, among other things, um, what makes it difficult for you to find and use fresh produce on a regular basis? And the top things that came back were, it's difficult for them to find enough produce from one local grower. They really don't know the grower community, so they were having trouble connecting to that grower community. And then how are they supposed to get it to the school as they need it? Um, they don't have a lot of extra time in food service, so delivery is very important to them. And it's a very important part of their operation that they get the food when they need it. On the other side, we looked to the growers that we had connected with, and we asked them, what makes it difficult for you to sell fresh produce to schools or other large organizations? So we heard from them that it's difficult for them to have time off the farm and to deliver to multiple places. It was difficult for them alone to produce sufficient volume. It was difficult for them to connect with food service, and then they lacked the storage for the quantities needed. So we were finding some common themes, and um, the most common theme was connection and distribution. So that's where our concept came into play for our food hub and our model. We determined that the largest barrier is a lack of a middle-sized distribution system that will work with small to medium growers. So really our model, um, kind of our number one word is partnership. It is important to us that growers and purchasers feel like they have a say in how the hub works. So we're to provide a collaborative, sustainable infrastructure where growers and institutions have their economic and nutritional needs met using that high quality local food. Um, we want to deliver it fresh, nutrient-rich produce, and increase the amount of local produce that is in student and community diets. We want to provide opportunities for growers to access this market, to bring them some long-term sustainable income. Um, technical assistance is also an important piece of what we want to do, providing that technical assistance to growers and institutions on both sides. And then again, like I said earlier, providing that connection. And probably the most important thing we do um, is matching supply and demand. So here's a little graphic on how our hub works. We are in the kind of the left-hand side of the slide right now where we are getting the local buyer feedback and the local grower feedback. So we're in that pre-season planning right now. Then we have our local food season will begin where our hub actually buys the produce from the growers and then buyers place their orders. We aggregate the orders here at Lakes Country. We fill the orders based on the, what the buyers have placed with us. Then we deliver it out to the buyers. The buyers are invoiced from us, and then we pay the growers. Um, we do have a tracking system in place. We have a lot ID system, which is very important, in particular to our institutions who would need to be able to trace their food. We do have purchaser expectations. Um, we do an estimate. Like I said, we call it matchmaking is what we're doing. We're trying to make sure that the buyers have committed to a certain percentage of food that they'll buy and that growers are able to provide it. So what we do from the purchasers is we do an estimate 
of the products and the amount that they are comfortable ordering, and we have them fill it out by week. And granted, it is an estimate, but they're pretty good about knowing how much food runs through their operations each day, so it's, it's not as hard as it may seem. Then we ask them to do their anticipated state date of, date of purchasing, and then we talk to them about what, which delivery days work best for them. And then um, we have the same expectation of growers, but we ask that our purchasers make sure that they're following all of the proper food handling procedures, including washing, storing, and using fresh produce. And part of that is Dana Reese um, went to the USDA Produce Safety University, and we have been using Dana's knowledge to help provide some um, classes for our buyers on how to handle whole food produce safely, storing temperatures, washing, etc. On the other side, um, we have some grower expectations, and these were put in place to help the hub be successful and to help growers be successful in the wholesale market. Um, because with our work with institutions, we know that they have to have certain expectations in place from where they get their food. So we ask growers to um, maintain product liability insurance. The amount of coverage is not set by us. That is decided between the grower and their insurance agent. We do ask that they attend good agricultural practices training, um, and that is where our partnership with the University of Minnesota Extension has come into play. Um, Michelle Sherman was actually just here today doing a GAP training for our growers. Um, and really, that's part of that technical assistance we want to provide to them. Um, we do not require GAP certification. We think that's too expensive. But we do want that good agricultural practice training in the background. Um, part of that GAP training, they are provided with a template for a farm food safety plan, and they just customize that to the farm. And they do have access to the University of Minnesota Extension and ourselves to help customize that for their farm. And that plan just addresses worker health and hygiene, the water systems, wildlife management, sanitation, traceability, et cetera. We also do a visit. Um, it's an on-farm visit from myself or Jane Eastis, who also is involved in our hub, or Dana Reese, and we go out and just kind of we just do a walk around of the farm. You know, show us your practices. Can we see your packing area? Can we see your washing facilities, et cetera? And then we ask from them, again, mainly to help us with that matchmaking process, is that they do a crop estimation. You know, how many green peppers do you think you could provide to the hub and about when would they be ready? And we take the buyer's information, we take the grower's information, and we put those two together to have a successful season. So we just came off of our pilot year. Like I said, we just started um, planning about a year ago in January of 2014. And so we wanted to cautiously step into a pilot year to make sure that this actually would be a sustainable model for a food hub. So we had nine growers participate. We had um, 11 school districts. We had a preschool, a hospital, and a nursing home. They worked with us for 12 weeks, and within that 12 weeks, we delivered just over 34,000 pounds of food. It was a wide variety. It was apples, it was broccoli, it was cauliflower, it was potatoes, it was a little bit of everything. So based on that, it's really important for us that this hub continues to serve the growers and the buyers. And so we asked them, how can we help you? And the number one from both sides was marketing. Please help us market. For growers, please help market what we're doing from buyers. Please help market that we're buying local foods, um, that public relations aspect of it. They would also like some further gap training. Um, growers in particular are looking for some business planning, technical assistance grant writing resources, um, more local food recipes so that people know how to incorporate it. And then on the buyer side, they love to advertise it. We did some posters this last year during the pilot year, and they would like more of those to put up. They'd like more information to share with the students about individual vegetable information. And then they really do 
want to connect, and it's one of our mission points, is to connect growers into the classrooms and cafeterias so that people understand where food comes from and we can make that connection. So that would include field trips to farms. So we asked the school districts in particular, you know, what did they like about Fresh Connect Food Hub? And it shows there on the slide. And it, it reinforced the fact that we were in the right direction, knowing that distribution and um, the connections were the real kind of obstacle to the local foods in our area. So they felt it was easy to order. They could make the farmer connections through Lakes Country. We had already done it. Done it. We were timely in our delivery. Um, they had less worry about on-farm food safety. And then they really did. We heard many times from our food service directors how much they appreciated the growers' work and how tasty the, the food was. Kids noticed it too. So as we head into our 2015 season, um, we've been doing grower buyer networking meetings. We had 53 people attend our latest grower buyer networking meeting. Um, we are expanding to additional institutions. We had essentially 11 participants. We are up to 19 participants for the 2015 season and we're still expecting that to grow. We are currently in that matchmaking process and we're continuing to connect growers and buyers, the more they know about what each other does, um, makes the hub stronger, makes the local foods effort stronger. And then again, that um, technical assistance, which is so important to, to both sides. So really the hub is kind of meant to be a hub, you know, trying to be the center of it and really trying to support our buyers and growers who are willing to do this effort with us. So those are my quick little slides. So I'm going to hand over to Jessica as a presenter. Excellent. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, that was just a fantastic uh, snapshot of the work happening in the service area. And everybody, please know that Jessica, <laughs> that Melissa is sticking around for the full session, as will Jessica and Arlene, and we'll uh, do question and answer. Uh, a portion of that time for the end of the session. So um, make sure you're dying up questions, and some of them might get answered by a presenter, but also we'll have plenty of time for passing in. And with that, I'm going to just do a quick introduction for our next presenter, Jessica Hopson Jessica was raised by a farm family with rural traditions, self reliance, and homemade hand and hard work. She moved into action the hard work of people of the city and then corporations, entrepreneurs, and travel. Now a wife and mother of two boys with a multi-sector experience and a shopping effort to develop home and land with the rail that we hope She is now working alongside a full city of community partners to embrace traditions, connect with innovation, a collective impact on the community's overall health and the health of future generations. Take it away, Jessica. Hello, and thank you, Molly. Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Salcedo here in Bemidji. And um, you're looking at my first slide, and uh, you're seeing uh, a meeting that we have. It's a producer's night at Sustainable Tuesdays, and just gives you a little peek at um, our classroom area. And I just also want to point out that Rail River Folk School is the host of Headwater Foods. On the um, map, you saw the Food Hub marked as Headwater Foods. And that is one of our partner organizations. And uh, Shell Christosik is Headwaters Foods, along with many other producers. So um, Rail River Folk School is a sustainability education community collective. And we focus on culture and commerce and instilling sustainable views and values <clears throat> into everyday practices for that collective impact on our whole community wellness. And we just are in the um, we're, we consider ourselves a hub of many things, and um, tonight I'm going to feature uh, the food portion. And you'll see here, this is uh, Cheryl Christosik of Headwater Foods, and one of our other farmer growers, and uh, some awesome heirloom tomatoes. So uh, just wanting to just really show you that this is uh, where we all come together. We're called Rail River because it's where the, the Mississippi River meets the railroad in downtown Bemidji. And we find common ground in local community, and we promote all things local and sustainable. And so um, what is a folk school? That's kind of an interesting concept, and it comes up a lot because, you know, folk school is maybe something unlike a lot of food hubs. And 
The Folk School is just sort of a general definition as a community learning center focused on hands-on learning experience for the students of any age. And it's a touchstone for local community of agripreneurs, craftspeople, artists, professionals, looking to extend their time-tried expertise along the future generations. And as we were establishing the Folk School, we realized it was like an arts and crafts movement. And we see food and farming as sort of where art meets science. And, you know, that handmade uh, farm fresh kind of grassroots hometown feel is, is something that our community really uh, responded well to. And we're trying to build a common legacy of the heritage that we have that provides sustenance for future growth and passing on what works in our area. So um, we are also, you know, looking at self-reliance as a really big value, um, but also that's connected back to community. And my slide's not advancing, there we go. I just wanted to share this slide with you. It's something that I came across um, from a presentation in some of the Minnesota Food Charter work, and it really informed us of how um, important this work is, and the food charter itself is something that really did inform a lot of our work. And you can see this food supply chain starts out in the middle of nowhere, it goes in a truck, it goes to a factory, it goes in a truck, it goes in a truck, over and over and over. You see how um, petrol intensive this is, how waste intensive, time intensive, and kind of illustrating that our Walmart sort of um, model our convenience food is not that cheap and it's not that convenient and it actually has a lot of costs associated with it. So that's kind of where the folk school meets, you know, um, sustainable foods. And um, what we see it as is that the food hub itself is a, a means to bring all these pieces together. But in the end, yeah, we are handling food, but it's really about the people. And in the end game, it's about our soil and our water. And uh, this is a bootstrapping effort, you know, built on trust between farmers and trial and error, and it's kind of a design process, but it's very hands-on. We got a lot of, um, you know, labor to show um, our commitment, but it's also not altruistic or uh, philanthropic. We are trying to find a means of which to make this economically viable, and we are looking for this to be sort of a slow food movement and that, um, we are, you know, letting it develop kind of organically, and, um, you know, we feel like it's really timely, and, and just, if we look at this as a change, as a possibility that we could embrace for our community, we have some factors in our environments that we kind of see the need that we want to reconnect back to our environments, um, mostly for the point of knowing where our food comes from, knowing our farmers, um, you know, and thinking about food safety. A lot of uh, what we've recognized is that Food is not always the most um, safe. It has a lot of potential for things that maybe you don't really consider, but that industrial agriculture food system doesn't always guarantee our safety. And there's even been some politicians that have noted that as, as one of our vulnerabilities. Um, and then our economy, you know, that fact that we are a net importer of food and the cost of healthcare in our uh, recent recession really did bring this local foods right home to us and we saw a lot of food uh, traditions and we wanted to um, you know, move into making this an economic force in our area. <clears throat> so the other piece that comes together is like as in sustainable foods, we talk about food security and versus food sovereignty. And we tend to focus um, on food sovereignty, but our food security, we start there and what food security means to us is that yes, there is enough for everyone. It's uh, non-deliberate about what the source is. So like the Walmart model is okay. We don't have anything against Walmart, but we just know that there are some other advantages to going local. And there's not necessarily any best practices when it comes to things like how to pay your workforce or how to uh, treat soil or how to um, you know, mitigate runoff. A lot of those things don't come into play when you're talking about commercial agriculture. Now also um, on the tip of food sovereignty, you know, it's that again, it is enough for everyone, but it has this equitable relationship for the producer and the laborer. And it brings into effect that triple bottom line that we talk about, which is people, planet, and profit. And I think that this is a really important distinction about what we're doing at Rail River and working with Headwaters Foods is that there's a commitment to sustainably sourced foods. And um, the reason is that we really believe that that is how it can um, impact our community's health. <clears throat> and we also note that if the world's 3.5 billion tillable acres were used with um, 
biological and regenerative practices, the world could sequester up to 40% more of current carbon dioxide emissions. So it's big thoughts, big concepts, but ultimately we really see that these little impacts come from small movements just like ours. And this is a quote from Paul Smith, um, a thought leader of the United Tribes, that a nation cannot be truly sovereign without the ability to feed itself. And I just, I'll, I'll call that food for thought, but um, you know, that's something that we consider. Um, we also are looking at that hub model. We provide a hub for all the things that bring us together around local sustainability. So we try to put family, friends, and fun all together around education, entertainment, and culture. And we see food and things like potlucks and um, farmers markets, a big important part of our food culture. And you know, what if we all started choosing to do little things to collaborate and work together? You know, small steps in the name of keeping it local and thinking about people, the planet, and the um, economic viability of it all. Uh, the impact that it may have on our next generation, it's pretty significant. And I often like to refer to the fact that, you know, if we all stopped paying for cable and donated all our money to PBS, our local PBS station, we might see a very different dynamic television set. So that's kind of where we're inspired, is that um, we can bring together this, um, you know, group of people. That's, we consider ourselves a community of practice, and that's coordinating, collaborating networks. And we share a concern, and we share a set of problems and a passion about our topic, which in this case is definitely food, local foods, heirloom foods, non-GMO foods. And um, we're looking to deepen our knowledge and expertise on this area on an ongoing basis. We also understand that the vast majority of food work has to um, involve cooperation. And cooperation to us is like this cooperating to see who can do the most, the best, the fastest together. And that seems to be a model that is absolutely necessary in local foods. We have many small um, producers. We have a lot of moving pieces. And we all need to collaborate and cooperation <laughs> to um, you know, really meet this, this demand of local foods. As um, all right, this is our facts. This is sort of um, the basic structure of our collaborative. The Rail River Folk School is organized as the collective host and a tenant of the local 303 company, which serves um, as a property management uh, business, and it provides uh, space for aggregation and a delivery drop site for the Headwaters Foods LLC, which is Cheryl Christosik as the producer, the procurer, and she also organizes the producer network. Um, and then we have another partner in our building called Be Well, and that stands for Beltrami Wellness Education for Long Life. It is a nonprofit, a wellness education consortium that allows um, us to collaborate and access to resources and grants. And we also look to inform policy work in our region and also um, new support systems that kind of help us you know, roll out some of these uh, newer concepts and put them in front of a group of really um, seasoned professionals. Our basic model of operation are, is, is um, you know, mixed with multiple streams of income. Like I said, this is really grassroots. And um, what we've realized is that through Headwaters Foods, as a seasonal tenant at Rail River Folk School, um, we've been able to serve farm to school, um, restaurants in our area, and we also have emerging institutional customers. And as well, we have two organic farms that do a weekly CSA drop at Rail River, and that serves approximately 40 families. And as well, we have um, many festivals and events that offer direct sales and some reoccurring and ongoing engagement um, in terms of selling products directly to customers. Our operational model, um, our hubbing, um, is a short-term aggregation for farm to school. We provide 24-hour building access 24-7 um, building access so that growers can bring their stuff in at 5 in the morning or 10 at night and put it into refrigeration. It can wait there for the folks that are coming in to pack and ship and track everything. We also provide some connection to volunteer support around accounting. Um, we've helped in creating the tracking system. We implemented uh, programs. We've maintained the space and a lot of the sort of um, behind the scenes work. And then occasionally we do provide uh, direct labor, you know, and especially in volunteer or um, sort of, uh, we'll call them intern kind of style scenarios that go directly to the farms 
and help in harvesting and packing and sometimes delivery. Um, our other model is the CSA model. It's the Community Supported Agriculture, and that's approximately 20 to 25 weeks in the summer months. And we, um, you know, create a designated space and time for the farms to drop their foods. And they have, um, also we've tried to develop some overlap so that we have that cross-pollination for programs such as Sustainable Tuesdays and some of our community uh, garden projects. And that just means that there's farmers and fresh food there when people come there for other things. So they don't necessarily conflict in times, but they get to see what, how beautiful everything looks. They get to ask um, questions directly of the farmers. And so it really does create that connection. Um, we also, with the CSA, provide some volunteer assistance again, and um, we help to support the EBT equipment in terms of just creating that wireless connection and helping just with a brief technological assistance at times. And then we also offer storage and holdover for um, customer, customer convenience for if people can't get to the pick, pick up their CSA on time, we do offer, um, you know, so they can pick it up the next day or something to that effect. Um, you know, the potential for expansion, I've included some details around um, what we hope to do. Um, and these are, you know, things that are kind of in the works. Some of them are actually started already, but um, one uh, potential is a year-round indoor retail market, and that's um, to dedicate to local foods, consignees and producers for uh, non-perishables and domestic goods. So we see that local, going local, it has to do with foods and also, you know, the things that you would maybe buy at a farmer's market, the preserves, and as well other um, dry goods. And so we also are um, hoping to provide dedicated procurement for community events. So we have uh, a food truck that parks at the Real River Folk School all summer long. They source with our farmers. We try to find as many matches as we can and to really feature the final cooked um, local foods as something that's sort of like bait for more customers. Um, the multi-farm CSA, we hope to expand our CSA offerings to not only um, organic produce, but potentially meat shares, farm shares, eggs, and preserves. And um, we would be just honoring those anchor farms that um, we've already um, established relationships with and just really are looking to promote their sustainable farms and, and their products. And another concept that we're working with around gleaning um, from some of those um, farmers market items that maybe are left over at the end of market time, but that we could take those gleanings and do a prepared frozen entree, like a CSA share. And that would be customized to uh, support daycares, busy families, and also community service um, centers, at, you know, like where they would be serving um, like meals on wheels and things like that. And we see that as an, another um, value added opportunity to engage sort of our foodie community as well as the farms themselves. And then finally, the social uh, piece that we're looking to add, and we've done this a few times, we just haven't made it reoccurring yet, but it's the Friday night farm and flea, and that's goods, products, produce, live entertainment, arts, and our burrito truck. And um, it gives people to, a time to stop by after work to socialize and avoid that grocery store on busy weekend evenings. And we're just really looking to, you know, make that fun and that convenience local as possible. Um, the benefits to our customers, again, it's the local sustainable sourcing, the trust factor. I mean, when you get to see the folks um, that are raising this food and you see the beautiful uh, condition that they are when they're presented, People start to really trust in that, and they start to recognize the difference in the value of that relationship, as well as the quality of the food itself. Um, the convenience is the, the range of drop times, um, you know, to, um, to, to the, I should say, pickup times. And then also that social impact that I was um, talking about earlier, that you can actually swap recipes and find out what's going on with your tomato plants at home. And, um, for farm to school, we, we have a lot of positive feedback from our schools around the simplicity of the tracking system and the one invoice. Um, our school district dietitian um, and uh, director of food services would only take a one invoice. So that's one of the services that just was really um, you know, prohibitive to a lot of, of the small farmers. They just didn't have the, the time to collaborate for a billing system. So we um, were able to get a small grant and install QuickBooks and do things like that to uh, streamline um, 
a pretty effective system. And then uh, we also uh, provide quality assurance, quality control, and then that uh, multi-source piece coming together to meet the, the demands of local foods as it grows is that you really do have to go back to those multiple um, producers to meet, meet the demand. And then um, again, systemized ordering and delivery and billing coming from one place, having one point of contact was really um, critical for our, um, our school customers. Um, and benefits to our growers, again, it's a one-stop drop <clears throat> at 24 seven access with uh, refrigeration and aggregation. We also offer, <clears throat> excuse me, long-term storage um, in our, our cellars in the basement. Our, our building was actually a, a fruit warehouse built in 1923. <clears throat> and so it has some historical cellar space that's pristine in our basement. So we're really excited to be able to kind of bring that back to life. <clears throat> and as well, um, we offer a lot of public engagement opportunities, just that access um, to all these different events and really, you know, seeing what it means to know your farmer. We also um, offer access to wholesale opportunities, relationship marketing, and business incubation, as well as the community connections. And business incubation often comes in the form of connecting with other professionals in our area or connecting back to the um, extension office. We just try to really um, share our knowledge and our, our, um, our networking abilities. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we consider ourselves a local sustainability working group. And it's you know working towards a more resilient food, regional food and market system, and tapping into tradition and innovation. And we work together to learn from neighbors and families, and um, we also uh, gather area specific best, best practices. So a lot of times, you know, we know that um, as we're learning about how to grow our own food, even if we are buying locally, it's really an important component to to understand the different kinds of growing practices, what that means when you cook, what's the difference in terms of your health. And a lot of these things have um, multiple impacts on our daily lives. So what it offers is a collaborative environment for a diverse group of people as instructors, farmers, community leaders, nonprofit, government, and private organizations. And we share resources and support. Again, it um, <clears throat> maximizes the potential for community-based success with uh, looking at uh, economic sustainability and being environmentally and socially responsible. And we also look to create other local enterprises and supporting education and research that is sort of a, a, a place to try out things in our market, new products. Um, and so <clears throat> we sample things, we have these producers nights and <clears throat> we really try to feature everybody's hard work and facilitate those partnerships. And this is kind of how we see it all fits together, just that in environmental and economic sustainability, you have this hub, and then we're really embracing our agrarian and sustainable local heritage. And a lot of times we um, work within farms that are, are growing to uh, indigenous traditions and things along the, the lines of heirloom um, vegetables. And we see that food art craft connection as kind of being at the heart of local sustainability. <clears throat> And um, this is the things that are actually, you know, in effect at our um, at our site. And it says potentials. And this was this uh, PowerPoint was made over a year ago originally. And this slide was, um, you know, all these things are actually starting to emerge. We have um, a permaculture group on site. We do we have a seed savers group. We've had classes around um, different soil conditioning, and we've offered those um, those lessons in our community garden. We also have um, green tourism going on. So we, we've been part of sustainable um, homes and places tours. Just a lot of things that are going on that really shows off um, all of our local knowledge. And so I do believe that is the end of my presentation. And I'm going to um, uh, talk about the Q&A portion of the webinar. And so, um, of course, uh, as you all know, Melissa and Jessica, as well as Arlene, are still on the line with us and, and uh, willing and able to answer all of our questions about the various food hub activities that you get a chance to participate on. So we're going to ask folks to chat your questions as you have a chance to do so. We have a pretty large group on the line tonight, and it sounds like um, having multiple mics on at a time makes it pretty difficult to, to hear 
um, uh, whoever is talking at once. So um, we'll get started here, I think, with a question from Dell. Dell, uh, Melissa had a question for you earlier on as you were presenting and wanted to know about whether or not you could um, share a copy of or if there is a copy available of the Fresh Connect safety plan that, that you were addressing in your presentation. And again, that one is for Melissa. Um, sure. <clears throat> I, I do, I think that is possible. I do want to check um, with Michelle Sherman from the University of Minnesota because that is who we work with on that plan and I just want to make sure she's comfortable with that, which I'm going to assume she is and, and we're happy to, to share that, yes. Great, thanks, thanks Melissa. I've got another um, question from Don chatted a little bit ago. Um, while you were presenting Arlene, uh, Don was just sharing what um, fantastic resources you've had and, and specifically mentioned the marketplace plan um, that you had on one of your slides, Irene, and wanted to know if that was something that you would be able to share at some point or, or if there's uh, any resources um, available on that front for others working on, on Food Hub build out. Uh, the answer is yes, that all of us that are working on these food hub resources throughout the state are actually working at working together on how we can support each other in our work throughout the region, but also we'll um, share all of our resources with anybody who has any interest in um, working in local food. So the answer is absolutely yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, another question uh, that I think probably um, might, might be good to start with you, Arlene, and I think each of you, maybe um, Jessica and Melissa, could weigh in on this too. How does someone become a grower for one of the food hubs? Um, I'll start with um, <clears throat> Most of our growers are grower to grower. Um, network. Um, so one grower gets connected to the hub and then another grower and so most of our growers are connected by grower to grower. Um, a lot of our growers are connected by some of our buyers when they go to um, move forward and to those market streams and say, hey, contact her. Um, <clears throat> Or um, food cooperatives, which are sort of a lot of you know, references from either our, our growers or our buyers. But it, I would encourage anybody who is a grower who has an interest in reaching out into any of the market streams of the numerous food groups throughout the state to, to just reach out and, and contact us directly. Um, most of us um, have web pages or um, Facebooks, and I think we're easy to connect to, but I would say just reach out directly to the Food Hub. Thanks, Arlene. Um, Melissa um, or, or Jessica, any, anything to add to that? Any um, unique features that uh, your, your house has instituted in regards to establishing new grower relationships? I can go <clears throat> first before Jessica goes. Um, what we did this year is we had a couple meetings for growers specifically who might be interested in growing for the hub. And we talked about how we work, um, grower expectations, and it allowed them to have a chance to ask questions. Um, we do know that not everyone wants to grow for a food hub. Um, it might not fit their business plan. And so we just share what our model is and what our expectations are of growers and what we hope to support them in doing. So like Arlene said, if they just want to reach out individually to the hubs, we, we'd love to have the conversation. But that's how we handled it this fall was we had a couple um, prospective grower meetings so that we could share our model. Thanks, Melissa. Jessica, any, anything um, to add to that that um, is, is different with Rio River? Um, okay. I don't think there's too much different. We do um, have our website, railriverfolkschool.org. That's a great way to connect in, and I'd be happy to, you know, field any questions and connect you with Cheryl, who works directly with our producers. We do have a um, commitment to sustainability and sustainable practices. We don't require organic certification, but we do um, require that you have a commitment and sort of a, a memorandum of understanding that you would commit to sustainable growing practices. 
And that just is um, really a commitment to what our, our customer base is demanding. So that would be my only addition and please contact us. Great, thanks so much, Jessica, and thanks for your mention of the um, of the website. I was sharing with Jessica earlier tonight that I had a chance to peruse their brand new website, and it was fantastic. And each of these three food hubs um, do have do have really informative websites. So, um, in in order to get in touch with folks following the, um, the presentation or just to check out more information, I highly recommend taking a few minutes to um, to skim through each of those websites. Um, we have a good question here from Pat as well on what kind of radius uh, the food hubs are covering. And I know that's different for, for each of you, um, but uh, interested to know um, uh, what that radius is. And it's probably a question that many folks are wondering. Anybody, anybody want to take that one for starters? I, I can do that. Um, I'm assuming it's asking our delivery radius. Oh, good question. That's interesting because I was kind of assuming it was talking, I was, I was assuming the other side of the, of the operation, but I don't know, maybe Pat, maybe Pat wants to chat that to us, but, but um, perhaps we can go ahead and start with the delivery, delivery stuff Sure, so um, Lakes Country's region covers nine counties. Um, so I think, you know, our delivery radius is about between 60 and 80 miles. Um, but like Arlene was saying earlier, some of the biggest challenge is the fact that we're in a rural area. So some of our delivery routes were eight hours in length by the time we made all of the stops that we needed to that day. Hence the refrigerated truck is so important to have. Um, the furthest we had to go to um, for, for produce was 150 miles. We went to um, Pine Tree Orchard in White Bear Lake for apples. We had tried to reach out to orchards in our area. Um, some of them had already committed their product. Others didn't have the best years in their orchards. So we went to White Bear Lake with um, Pine Tree, which is the local Minnesota grown apples. So that's the delivery side and the procurement side of it. And um, uh, Arlene or Jessica, anything, anything you want to add to that? Your to our, our region, we work with our Headwaters Food Sovereignty Council, which is established as a, I think it's 10 counties in total, but we wanted, we basically took the triangle of the three reservations that surround us and connected all of the counties that touch each reservation. And that is the range from a, between about 50 and 75 miles. Our most outlying producer, uh, producers at this point come from a family of Amish farms that I believe are probably supplying more than one food hub from that area. And then our, um, it, that would be near Brazy, I believe. And then our um, most outlying schools would be um, Red Lake and Panema to the north. And then to the south, it's uh, Laporte, I believe, would probably be the furthest south. And then off to Cass Lake to the east. <clears throat> That's about it. And, and, and this, we tried to just make that commitment as a, that 10 county region. It also sits um, right within our Northwest Regional Sustainable Development um, Partnership region. And they've just been really integral in revitalizing that Highway 2 corridor idea and um, working with statewide health improvement programs. So those regions also nest within our, our region. Great. Thank you. It sounded like Arlene, you um, had, some, had some good stuff to add to that as well. Well, as I stated in my presentation, we're, you know, procuring from gold to eight and from distributing to six. Um, and you really, when you're operating a small food hub, you really got to put those logistics into consideration because <laughs> when driving that truck out to deliver, you want to bring it back for the produce for your next delivery. So, well, we don't have a good definition of, you know, local to us is 150 miles or 50 miles or 75 miles. It's really when we're talking about it, we're talking about with our growers as well, you know, working with them to get them to, to um, bear more of that cost of bringing that food to the facility as well. Because one of the things that we've realized after two years is that any cost that should stay on the farm should stay on the farm. And if you're any big um, distributor of any size, 
your cost share would be to get that produce from your farm to the warehouse where you turn it in and your place for payment. And so we're working with a lot of our growers on that as well. So, you know, it's really kind of a gray area right now. You're not getting very good at it. <laughs> came in from uh, the two at the Farm Market Cafe. To all of you presenters, how do you manage payroll, cash flow, employee training, and retention, uh, and grow, uh, lower price negotiations? Mommy, I didn't hear the last part. Lower what? Um, pricing happens to be one of the hardest things to do because we're working in the wholesale market and we're working with buyers that have small margins on the food. Um, so you heard me say that we do a lot of price points with our uh, buyer accounts because um, we can we have to we sell greater volume to a school and we sell it at a lower price because we have a greater volume. Where when we work with restaurants, we're selling a lower volume, but we can afford to raise the price because we can they can meet that price point in order to continue to engage in local foods. Um, as far as um, overhead and staff retention, I have to tell you that Scout has some of the best staff ever. I don't think I could fly in like people, and I just got really, really lucky. Um, as far as overhead, that's really the toughest part of the game is trying to manage the difference between your gross revenue and your cost of goods sold because you've got to pay out so much money to buy what you're going to sell, and we've got that difference between the gross revenue, and that's all you have for your operating margin. And so all of your utilities, your fuel, your insurances, your personnel costs, everything has to come out of there. So we're really, really tight on our margins, which is why you heard me say we're trying to shrink some of the things that we can in order to minimize that margin. And Barb, if you have more questions after that, you can email me. <laughs> Um, uh, Jessica, what, what are some of your experiences up, in, up at Rail River with um, the various uh, admin aspects that Barb's asking about? Or, or Melissa. <laughs> Jessica or Melissa, anything that you can weigh in on with payroll, cash flow, oh. employee training? I can. Sorry, I thought I was um, on. I didn't know I was muted. Um, I can answer the question. You know, our first um, steps were um, towards the administration portion. We're funded by a grant from the Northwest Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. So that allowed us to do a lot of that upfront implementation of systems and purchasing um, some of the materials and supplies that streamline that system. And those were handed directly over to Headwaters Foods. And then I offered um, administrative support, you know, to, and as a backup, you know, and also we don't actually have full time or any um, employees, so we don't handle payroll at all. Um, um, everything at Rail River is done on a volunteer basis, and Headwaters Foods is owned by Shell Christosik, and she doesn't actually purchase the food outright from the producers. We um, aggregate an invoice, and then the farmers are paid off of um, those invoices, and there's a 10% um, handling fee that's uh, assessed and that goes directly to the procurer. So that means that she files her own taxes independently for those for that income. But we do struggle always with overhead, um, you know, maintaining the structure itself and, um, you know, the struggle is often uh, more in, in the winter months and maintaining, you know, the, just keeping the structure um, heated, but as well, um, you know, we we look to you know, multiple streams of income. So that's the thing about Rail River Folk School is that we do a lot of other things as well. We have anchor tenants, we have a marina on site. There's things that help offset that cost. And we try to reserve 25% of our resources towards um, basic nonprofit activity. So that um, comes into play with us being owning our own building and being able to shift resources as necessary so that we can provide these services to things that matter the most to us. I'll just pass it on to Melissa now. 
Yes, um, like Arlene said, pricing is the toughest thing that we do. When we did our survey of our um, growers, they had said they wanted to be between um, five and 10% of what they pay the broadline distributors. Um, that's, that's a pretty tight margin. Um, and so on the grower side, we're pretty clear that we do not expect to be their only source of revenue. They should, we should just be a diversification of um, the other things that they do. Um, and when we had our grower and buyer meeting this year, we presented what we call the three sides of pricing, the demands that our institutions face, the requirements that our growers have for what they're producing, and then what the hub has to operate on also. So those, that's kind of our triangle of pricing as we factor it. Um, we're also pretty clear that um, Fresh Connect is lucky in the sense that it has an anchoring institution in Lakes Country Service Cooperative. So we did not have to create an HR department or a finance department. Um, that already existed within Lakes Country. And so we consider Lakes Country one of the funders um, because our board of directors has committed to this idea and in that they've committed some of the resources of Lakes Country to help support it and get it off the ground. And then eventually um, it lives off of its own revenues. Right. Thank you. So helpful to hear is um, interesting again to kind of uh, hear the common themes and, and um, similar resources and then and then the unique models that each of the hubs and the research hubs and connection. I think we'll just take uh, well, one, one final question here. Um, are some hubs generally only in rural areas? And um, I can answer that, that that is a no, but to our, our presenters, um, can you explain or talk, speak a little bit more about the food hub activities that you see happening in the suburbs and the Twin Cities? Maybe Melissa, we'll start with you. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, when we were doing the feasibility study, um, this probably would be easier in a metro area, suburb area. Uh, just because of the access to the populations that you have. As I said earlier, our, our route, one of them was eight hours in length. I mean, that's, that's a lot of costs associated with an eight hour um, distribution route. So um, we do know what goes on. We know in, in particular the Minneapolis Public Schools is doing a lot with um, local growers and getting that into processing and back into their food program. Um, so yeah, there is some work going on. Um, we knew the rural area poses a certain challenge to it, but we also know that the strength in it is such the community belief in local foods, um, supporting the local economy, supporting each other. Um, and so we knew that was a strength on which to draw. Jessica or Arlene, any reflections on do you have activities in the, the urban areas? I think that Melissa hit on it right that, um, and I talked about it when we used to the presentation, that um, you know, we have the largest barrier in urban, I should say the two largest barriers in urban are the population and then the geographical actual logistic of moving the food that many miles. So you heard me to say they have an eight hour distribution. And when I'm working with some of the Amish growers and we go out and we do our Amish route, it's 180 miles round trip uh, to go out and work with those growers. And that's you know, five or six hours of somebody's time as well. So all of those, and you have to factor that cost into when you're providing that service, you know, you know, we charge them a percentage of the commodity in order to have our wheels on the road to go get it. So, you know, it's basically, you know, identifying the barriers and, and then identifying strategies and engaging in them and then and planning and doing and redoing and reacting in order to keep the wheels rolling. Uh, Minneapolis Public Schools do see a lot of uh, conscious school within the school district. But they have a broadline distributor who's actually got, like, a, a, they have an anchor institution and a broadline distributor who's doing their kind of school. Um, so there are so many models. There's really not a whole lot of consistency in the model, except for it's all about local foods. I can see that 
can say the same thing. Um, what I do know is that I think that the food hubs that you're working and looking at in the larger metro area are dealing with farms that are at a, maybe a one step larger in terms of scale. And it maybe it doesn't have quite the capacity to have that that direct connection and sort of that, that, that consumer loyalty that I see so much. And I have to, um, you know, sing the accolades of Cheryl's work within Headwaters Foods is that, you know, um, both uh, the Bemidji School District and LaPorte School have received recognition and awards for the volume of um, local foods that they have used in their menus in the last few school years. And I believe Marlene Webb of uh, Bemidji School District received a, a national gold certification and was um, honored you know, at a, in somewhere in Washington, D.C. So I think that, you know, we're making these impacts in, you know, greater Minnesota, but I think that the people involved are actually so hands-on that um, we'll, we'll see the, the same amount of impact as we might have in a large metro area. Well said. Because there's some, um, you know, really thoughtful work and comments to, to wrap up tonight's session on Food Hubs in Northwestern Central Minnesota. And again, a big thanks to all of our presenters for you know, tonight's session and presentation, of course, but for your timing and championing work in uh, across greater Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you.